What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and we're looking today at a resource that I wish I had back when I was taking orchestra auditions. Like most people training to take orchestra auditions, I had stacks and stacks of music all over the place. It was a giant disaster whenever I was taking an audition. I ended up learning that I had to take all that material and put it into a binder, and I would carry this binder all over the place. And the author of the book we're looking at today, John McCulloch Benner from the Milwaukee Symphony, he can relate. This is a lot of what I was working from. So what John did, which is the best kind of pandemic project in my mind, is to take all that material and synthesize it down and find a way to communicate clearly what he'd like to let people know about the major orchestral release excerpts. So that's what we're gonna dig into today. You know, it's probably an idea that, you know, a lot of people have had, but one thing that in particular that kind of drove me to do it, you know, I think I say in the intro, like I've had the idea to do this for years and just kind of compile it all into one place and to also include some very, you know, just logical ways of looking at it that hopefully will help people. The idea of having everything in one place is like one that really, at least it helped me. I, I remember when I was young and having all these different excerpt books and, you know, if if I forgot to bring one to a lesson or something, it was not a, not a good feeling. The thought of having everything in one place definitely was part of the driving force, but also to incorporate a lot of just that applicable knowledge. Okay, let's take a look inside. This is an auditioning double basis toolkit. It's got bowing, fingerings, and useful tips for standard audition repertoire, and that is true for sure. The amount of work that John must have put into this, I can't even begin to imagine, having done less ambitious projects like this myself over the years. Okay, so we dig in. So we've got the thank you here in the outset, and now we've got all this rep, and I have been having such a good time the last couple of weeks going through and playing all of this. My wife, came out and said, what are you doing? Because she used to hear me play these excerpts back when I was taking orchestra auditions. And it's been fun to go in and look at this rep through John's eyes. John's profiling, I think 16 pieces in here, and they are the bread and butter of just about any double bass audition. Will you see other music besides this? Yes. Should you learn this music if you're auditioning, especially here in the United States? Yes. And I like in this intro how John sort of has an existential crisis writing about auditions at a moment here, late 2020, where there are no auditions, not for the current moment at least, and what those will look like going forward, obviously nobody really knows. Whether you're thinking about the current moment and the circumstances we're in right now or not, this is just a wonderful resource for the ages. An experienced bassist, principal bassist of several major orchestras here in the United States, John has really, thought out how he's laying out this material, and I love these various passes that he takes at these pieces. So let's get into it. Okay, we got the Bach Orchestral Suite number two, and this is so much fun if you get a chance to play it, either in a modern setting or in a Baroque ensemble. That is particularly fun for me. And the way John lays out the Bach, this is gonna set the tone for the entire book going forward. So let's just take a look at a few of these details. Anybody editing music has to walk the line between not including enough information on the page and including way too much information on the page. That's something I've struggled with a lot over the years, and I really like the way John approaches this. So what he does is he shows you what string you're on and then he only indicates when you go to a new string. So you'll stay on that string until you see the new string indication. So here we've got the G string and then we don't switch to the D string until the F sharp. Now, some people mark positions, some people mark shifts. That can get into a whole bit of messiness, especially if you start to think about pivoting and the like. John just doesn't mark that stuff. He shows you string, finger number. And in my opinion, that is plenty because there are so many ways we could adapt this for whether we're a pivoter or whether we shift for everything or that kind of thing. Whenever I look at a new edition or a new work like this, I love to really try to adhere to what the editor has on the page. I might end up doing different fingerings, sure, but I really like looking at the music through John's eyes. And so I've gone through and played every single fingering in here. There's obviously a lot of latitude in fingerings, but I think it's really interesting to do that whenever I'm looking at something new. There's already a lot of info in here already. And so in order to, you know, kind of make it a little bit cleaner, you know, putting 
everything that's related to a fingering below as opposed to, you know, jumping above and then jumping down, like saying, okay, what's that supposed to mean? Because like, you know, anytime you put a third finger, would that potentially be confused with the triplet? Probably not. But you know, like that kind of thing. In addition to these excerpts from these major pieces, John gives you all this wonderful background information, things he's learned about the piece along the way, things to think about when practicing, and even example exercises for practicing. I think that's so valuable. I have written so many exercises like this out in my own parts and students' parts. And again, getting the experience of someone with real professional experience and seeing the way that they recommend practicing it, I think it just can't be beat. John then lays out what he calls line shapings. So it's kind of phrasing, not exactly, kind of dynamics, not exactly, but it's something that's really valuable. The thought of it, you know, I I had a few different approaches to that as far as like, you know, I, I knew that that was something that I really wanted to incorporate into the book. Of course, there are like so many different ways that you can talk about, you know, phrasing or, or anything, but in thinking about the shape of the line and how each phrase can breathe, where do you put emphasis? Where do you not put emphasis? You know, that kind of thing. I felt like that was really important. I, I went a, a lot back and forth, you know, trying to decide, okay, do I want to do just like regular hairpins, dotted hairpins? On the editorial side of things, like what is the clearest way to show this? The dotted hairpins, I, I think were probably the, the best approach there, but it's definitely worth noting, especially if there's any excerpt that might not have any dynamic in there, like the Bach Violin Concerto second movement. There's nothing really notated in there, but in order to actually make something of it where it's not going to be so plain, put yourself in the shoes of somebody that's on the other side of the screen. They want to hear a musician making music. As much as it's good to just have something that's completely plain because the part is plain, there still has to be something in there. And so I guess that's kind of where that stems from. John makes sure to mark your extension and whether it's going to be open or closed and what to have it open or closed down. I know that John must have a really fluid, easy to work extension because some of these openers and closers that he's got, uh, I my extension chops <laughs> just aren't there to execute on it. But he talks about that too in the book. I know I've used this phrase a lot in the book. It's always good to be flexible, especially thinking about how how our industry has evolved into especially the audition process, not a whole lot of that is going to change. Right. And especially with, you know, a lot of people having, at least in, in my case, having a lot of extra time right now, what better way to investigate how we can do our art better, especially for anyone that might have been like right on the verge of the audition trail going into the spring. I mean, that, that would have been quite quite the blow to figure out like, okay, like all these auditions were going to happen and none of them are. What do I do now? He takes a slightly different look at all of these different excerpts, depending on the composer, the time period, and talks about what's important, what he sees people get tripped up on in auditions, musical mistakes that he's seen over the years, really interesting stuff. I found this line shaping particularly helpful for these Brahms excerpts. I have been practicing them for so many years over my life, and I've got these bad habits sort of baked into them from my own practicing. And this line shaping, just having that on the page and nothing else, it really got me thinking about where I want this music to go. Think about it, you know, again, Brahms two letter E. So what happens there? Like the violas, and I think it's the clarinets, I think, that have these like really kind of funky syncopations. da dun da dun da dun da dun And so like, if you're a viola, you know, put yourself in their shoes. If if you're a violist on that committee and, and a bass player isn't necessarily playing totally in time, you know, how's that gonna go? We got a few Strauss excerpts to round it out. Almost always playing Strauss on auditions. At least that's been my experience. Got some Don Juan, got Heldenleben, some of the major sections out of Heldenleben. And then we finish off with Verdi Otello, that famous act for Soli. That's a look inside John McCulloch Benner's new book. I really dig it. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you're thinking about the skills needed to take auditions, I would also suggest checking out Hal Robinson's book, Boardwalkin'. It is incredible, and we'll link up to that here. Thanks again, we'll see you in the next video.